And so we'll just move straight on to our final speaker, uh, Rahim, um, who is going to talk to us about 5G. Okay. So what I want to talk about is where we are going to go in future. I just want to show you this one in terms of the economic impact that broadband, whether it is fixed or it's a more or less mobile, has on the economy and the exact accurate correlation, the competitiveness of economy has with the number of broadband lines that we have. And that picture uh, was um, published two years ago, uh, mentioned all the com uh, countries and the economy and the number of broadbands per hundred population that um, is available. More to that is being reported that in the US, uh, the GDP could be increased by $100 billion if you increase 10 additional broadband lines for every 100 individuals, 10% increase. That is, <laughs> means about 30 million lines. But this is a fixed broadband. The similar figures that in the EU, 50% of economic growth in the European Union is driven by information and communication technology. So it's been reported that about in UK as well, sometimes between 10 to 12 percent of the GDP is comes from communications uh, and internet. And uh, that is a directly direct benefit to the GDP. Indirect contribution to GDP is being quoted up to 20, 25 percent using other industry using the ICT infrastructure. And to some extent, it's been said that broadband could be the solution, it could be the answer to the ailing economy that we have. So I think everybody in the room probably agrees that broadband is important. But what is happening? You've seen from our colleagues, figures of 1,000 times, and et cetera, or 100 times, uh, increasing the mobile data traffic. It was first mentioned by these guys, Docoma and Huawei. In the white paper I was writing about three years ago, and Cisco followed that with these statistics. And it looks like from 2010 until now, the mobile data traffic has been doubling every 12 months. That's what has been said. And 90% of the total mobile data traffic that we see now, it has been generated in the last two years. 90, some people say up to 99% of that. It has been generated from the, in the last two years. So, I want to surprise you, if, we, if this carries on, doubling of the traffic every, every year, so every 18 months or every year. In 20 years' time, in 2030, the traffic will be 1 million times compared to 2010. So are we designing the system, the future system, for 1,000 times, which is in 2020, in seven years' time? Or are we designing the system for one million times, which system should be around for at least another 10, 12 years. So let's, people say, why, where is the source of all this traffic? Why the sudden surge of the mobile data traffic? And what is a killer application? This is the old word that people you always used to, to uh, use in order to justify going from one generation to another generation. My answer to them is everything on internet is a killer application. So the whole internet is, is a killer application. As we didn't know about two years ago about social networks, the, the content of the internet applications have become much richer and much more sophisticated in the last two years. 
the average web page in the last five years has tripled. 75% of HTTP requests are images. Average file size on the web is 10 megabytes. Video accounts for 99% of all the bytes trans transferred in the last two years. And in addition to that, people are using internet more and more. So some statistics, six billion mobile subscriber as of today, 200 million mobile smartphones sold every quarter, 120 uh, million applications downloaded every day from mobile. It is only from mobile. Four billion YouTube views every day. And so and so and so, 200,000 tweets every minute. I remember when Sir Alex Ferguson uh, announced his retirement. In the first four hours, it was 1.7 million tweets were exchanged in only four hours. So, as many people say, can we carry all this traffic? And is there a floor in the spectrum? And some people say, Wi-Fi will save us to carry all this traffic. We've done a similar study. We did it with Interdigital. Look at the traffic growth over the years. We look at different environment categories, like working population in a city, offices, peak, and mean, and projected over the years. We assume this is correct, this traffic projection. We look at 4G. This is release 10. And for different amount of spectrum and different cell sizes. We are, and we wanted to see what is the capacity we, we, are, we can offer with the 4G uh, standard. So we look at the cells of 25 meter radius, cells of 50 meter radius, and cells of 150 meter radius. This is the distance between the sides. So half of it is the cell radius. So the capacity here for 25 meter radius cells of all LTE is this one. And the capacity for cells of 50 meters and so and so is there. And this is the year that where we are going to hit the spectrum crunch or the spectrum the flow. So what is the role of Wi-Fi? We look at 11G. We have also got some results for 11N as well as 11AC. This is the effect of Wi-Fi <coughs> deployment, like 25% of the uh, per kilometer squared which is, uh, is Wi-Fi covered, as well as the 6%, we look at that as well. This is 11G, of course. The effect of Wi-Fi on the <laughs> Total traffic is this much. In the, in the best case, is this much. So Wi-Fi is solution only for short term. It's not a long-term solution at all. Even with 11 C, uh, 11AC and 11N. So what happens in the UK? That situation was one of the scenarios. It was a UK scenario. And the city we taken into consideration was London. In the UK, 2015, in a busy hour period, we assumed that 15% of the mobile users are active. In 2020, a small amount increase in the activity of the mobile users, 20%. <coughs> this is the important figure, which is capacity. Capacity per coverage area. 2.8 gigabits per second per meter squared we require in a 
dense urban environment. In 2020, we required 53 gigabits per second per kilometer square. Not per cell, as it was a definition in 2G and 3G and 4G, et cetera. It's per meter square. So the ratio between these is means 19 times more capacity we require. If we, in future, the new gen technology to come, if we ad approach it the way that we have approached 2G, 3G, and 4G, we require 19 times more spectrum. OK, we don't believe in these figures. We require 10 times more spectrum. We don't believe in these figures. We require five times more spectrum. We do not have five times more spectrum. The best we can have for radio spectrum will be twice as you could see on Simon Sunder's slides. With the most we'll have, we'll have one gigahertz of the spectrum. At the moment, we have 500 megahertz of the spectrum for mobile communication. We do not have that sort of luxury. So the moral of the story is, the way we approach the new generation has to be fundamentally different to the way that we approach 2G, 3G, and 4G. And it is not about the speed. That was the main characteristic of 2G, 3G, 4G, and justification for that. Higher speed and higher speed and higher speed. I believe personally that 4G provides a decent amount of speed. Our eyes and ears doesn't have so much bandwidth, more than the speed that 4G provides. So that's not the priority. Priority is enough capacity with this definition. So this generation game, do you remember 1G, the big phones, tax system? It looks like every 20 years, a standard is introduced in market, and it peaks in terms of the capacity. It takes about 20 years for every standard. So it takes about 10, 12 years before it is introduced to market to do some research and standardization. And if you believe in this trend, it looks like we are one year late for research into 5G. <coughs> 2011 was the right year. But there is another subtle information here. The time between 1G, 2G was 12 years. 2G, 3G, 10 years, 3G, 4G, 8 years. I believe that 4G to 5G will be 7 years. So 5G will be with us in, before 2020. So it's not a, such a long-term technology. So people ask me, what is the problem, 5G? It's a bad, the problem is mobile data traffic is doubling every year. Capacity from one generation to another generation roughly doubles every 10 years. We are facing this spectrum crunch. So what is 5G? It's more about sustainability of mobile business, a broadband business. Spectrum, capacity crunch, network operation, cost of the energy. I was in China uh, until last night. There was a presentation from China Mobile, which is the biggest mobile operator in the world. They have 1.1 million, million base stations to cover the whole China. Which is, scales is unbelievable. And they said to me, the cost of the energy last year, 2012, was 14 billion kilowatt hour to run the network. So energy, the cost of energy is very important, as well as the cost of the network. I believe last is the speed is important in that order. So some journalists have been contacting me and say, oh, Raim, what happens if we don't have 5G? I mean, I thought that was a very interesting question. I said, OK, from consumer's point of view, if we don't have 5G, because we don't have so much spectrum to allocate to 4G and et cetera beyond. 
it will be like you are in a Waterloo, Waterloo station in a busy hour time, and you are using Wi-Fi system. How patchy that would uh, service be. From the operator's point of view, the operators always had provided the best quality of experience and reliability to the customers. And they will not be able to do that. So how we approach this is not only by having a new spectrum. As Sarah mentioned, one important aspect is the way that we handle the data. If you understand your customers better by analyzing the big data, the way they use the service, which type of service they use, et cetera, and if you have all that information from the big data, you, the data distribution in the network is extremely important. In parallel to that one, we need to look at area spectral efficiency. What sort of capacity you provide? per meter squared, and work on technologies to improve that. Going to smaller and smaller cells is very expensive. Uh, Huawei, if they say 100 times denser networks, it's all right for them because they want to sell more access points. But if you ask Telefonica, I say, no, how, how the hell am I going to manage 100 times more cells? The cost of it. These are very primitive and naive solutions. So 5G Innovation Center, based on this argument that we have had and discussion we had, we are our industrial partner. Those who follow tweets, this is our tweet, I can't. There's not so much information on that one because I'm a bit lazy, uploaded with the information, but you can join us. And I will not go into this detail of this. OF, the moral of the story on this one is OFTM, as the 4G is based on, is not suitable for small cells. It's what discussed about carrier aggregation. It cannot do efficient carrier aggregation. It is not energy efficient. It's not suitable for management of 10 times or 100 times more cells, small cells. So we need to look at alternative technologies. Another trend is in the business model. Sarah mentioned about infrastructure sharing between operators, Vodafone and Telefonica. Uh, T-Mobile and Orange have already joined do this infrastructure sharing. But if you do infrastructure sharing intelligently, for example, you have uh, two networks, if the networks are co-located, all the base stations, that's where we are. If they are shifted with respect to each other by one radius of the cell, that's where we are. With no extra spectrum, but just doing more a clever infrastructure sharing, you can increase the capacity between 10% to 50%. More importantly, you can increase or decrease the, increase the power efficiency of the network by 60%. So the assets that we have, if we use it more intelligently, we can do a lot of better utilization of our assets as well as the radio and the spectrum as, uh, than what we have been using. And that's what 5G is about. Capacity, I will not go into detail of this, 4G is here. We have the potential of increasing the area capacity five, six times more without going to too many small cells. Energy, we use bigger part of this pie when the cells are in a standby. There's no traffic. You have to keep it on. This small portion is for signaling. This portion is actually for the transmission of the data. So this amount of energy is wasted. We need to look at the techniques that we can switch off some phone, uh, some base stations, as well as some clever techniques that we can further 
reduce the signaling aspect. The way that we have been defining 3G, 4G, et cetera, what is the peak rate? Like what we did in LTE. ITU said 100 megabits per second per cell and one, gig one gigabits per second per cell. That's all they did. These parameters, these metrics are not viable anymore. So Ofcom, regulators, ITU, they need to start thinking about the new metrics. So, as a result of that, the 5G Innovation Center, with our industrial partners, Fujitsu and uh, Telefonica, some of them are still in this room, and one third of the funding <coughs> provided by HEFKI, UK government, and two third uh, non-public funding from our industrial partners, we're going to set up a new center where the industry as well as our own researchers will work. Uh, on such advanced technologies for 5G. And the idea is not just to do paper study. We want to generate lots of IPRs, and our industrial partners will take this and influence the standards. You've seen the f eight funding members here, and since it's been announced, BT, EE, Ofcom itself, as well as China Mobile. They all joined this... Um, we say center. What we're going to do, we're going to test the technologies, not only the paper study and computer system. We're going to set up a test bed. This is a coverage area of four kilometers squared. We have, those who have been at Surrey University, there is a cathedral in Guildford, and this base station here will be on top of the cathedral. The priest doesn't know yet, <laughs> but he will be, he will, uh, we will tell him. And inside the campus, we're going to have 10 to 12 access points, connected fiber optics, as well as the wireless back uh, connectivity. All of this will be connected to Vodafone in Newbury to using their core network to have an end-to-end -end system. And also, there is a discussion that we're talking with Telefonica or two to use some of the infrastructure they used for the Olympic or London 2012 as part of the testbed in London. And Inside the campus, uh, this is A3 uh, motor, uh, road. You can start any test on the road, come to Big Randabad in, uh, before you enter the university, and go through different cell size and different dimensions and carry out the tests. So it's going to be small cells. It's not going to be big, ugly base stations as it was so far. And this is a picture I nicked from Telefonica as part of the networks. And it will be invisible sort of base stations. So we are going to look at the new air interface. We are going to look at the backhaul, fiber optics, as well as the wireless backhaul. We're going to look at the new architectures for cellular system and self-optimization techniques and intelligent handling of the big data and designing the customers better. And combination of all of this will be tested. 2013, 2015, we're going to do all the capacity, all the techniques under 5 gigahertz. <laughs> and we want to explore new Fuxi bands. <coughs> Samsung, uh, Samsung 5G was the technology they developed for beamforming was at 28 gigahertz. So everybody started looking at the much higher frequencies. And we are interested to understand and better appreciate what had the, this sort of frequencies in millimetric bands behave for mobile communication, not only for the backhaul, but for the radio access as well. So the door is not closed by no means. This is UK facility, UK facility, and we want to work with all the international universities and industry, with, mainly with SMEs in our uh, country. And uh, we are working with Ofcom. We're working with the Minister of Defense on new spectrum releases, as well as the, all the uh, government agencies, and, uh, and many more. Thanks very much. <laughs>